I have very much been looking forward to this week's sermon. As is quite evident by now for anybody who's visited with us on Sunday morning, I love quotes. So indulge me as I share a few of the quotes that this morning's priestess immediately brought to the forefront of my mind. A poet by the name of Connor McDonald wrote, there is a fear when you scream into the never ending dark, when your voice is thick with emotion, releasing all of your pent up feelings in a single long cry. Ben's priestess spoke of feeding the void with unfulfilling and often unnecessary things or flurries of activity. A never ending stream in an attempt to produce a feeling of wholeness. I don't believe that such a cavern can be filled with things or even activities. In my past, attempts at doing so have created a feeling of emptiness, creating a life filled with the antithesis of integrity, division. For integrity is wholeness or the state of being whole and undivided. Stephen Marley wrote, your mind is the channel of it all. It feeds your soul, your heart, everything. It comes from your thoughts. The kind of person you are comes from the way you think and it bleeds into the way you feel and such forth. If the mind is not free, then we won't be free. For me personally, that is integrity, an undivided state from which wholeness blooms, a state of being that frees you. Said wholeness nurtures the magnificence of your heart, mind, and soul. For from integrity, a loving foundation is inevitable where the heart, mind, and soul, soul and strength will flourish. Or as Anita Morjani wrote, the greatest truths of the universe do not lie outside. They lie deep within us in the magnificence of our heart, mind, and soul. One of the most beautiful things about Unitarian Universalism is that we honor all beliefs. In fact, as many of us are quite aware, our third principle is acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. This morning, I am honored to introduce a speaker whose words and insight are suffused with such principle. A founder of the collective church into land, which much like Mosaic is better described than defined. They are a similar intergenerational spiritual community where different people from different backgrounds come together. Just like Mosaic, they do everything in the spirit of love and grace. It is truly an honor to introduce Pastor Ben Collins. Welcome back, Ben. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. It is great to be here. I am uh, really, uh, <clears throat> really grateful to be with you guys, to be able to uh, be here live, especially. Um, I appreciate the introduction, and uh, I have to ask for the slideshow that we opened with. It was so good. I really want to get uh, some of the quotes I was trying to keep up and look up some of the uh, some of the quotes and names that uh, that you guys were uh, sharing. Um, so I think I want to begin where where the introduction left off with uh, the similarities of our communities, and I guess especially the focus on integrity. Um, and I hope that, like me, you guys have have sensed uh, the sort of the need for integ integrity by its absence in the last year. Um, the fact that we're living in a world that seems so clearly uh, uh, fractured, um, that we seem to be increasingly uh, at, odd, at odds, not just with each other, but with ourselves, um, battling internal contradictions that come with, I believe, the process of change uh, and the process of evolving and, and uh, becoming these people that we've sort of so beautifully held out before us uh, this morning. Um, so my, uh, I'll begin with Star Wars, um, just because I like the way that, that Teresa sort of introduced, uh, you know, the connection to the church and, you know, the fact that I'm, yeah, I'm an ordained United Methodist pastor. Uh, but for me, I think, I think that means a little different than it does for a lot of people. My, one of my favorite sermons ever last Christmas actually was uh, that that Jesus is not Luke, Jesus is Yoda. Uh, Jesus is not the hero. Um, he's the guide. And so I fit right in at Mosaic because I, I come as somebody who uh, I, I sat under Jesus as my guru, but I don't need Jesus to be a sacred object uh, that performs something for me 
in order for the Christian faith and tradition to be valuable. And so uh, what I'm really looking for in, in Jesus, I find in, in sort of this question that's been on my mind and heart more in the last year as I try to simplify my life and clarify what it is that I'm doing uh, with a short time that I have, uh, you know, in this life. And when Jesus is asked to summarize his sort of understanding of spiritual practice, he, uh, first of all, he quotes something that already exists, which I think is such a great and humble move. You know, he sort of has the floor to create his new religion. And uh, somebody asks him what's most important. And instead he quotes something that already exists. Uh, he says, listen, and I love that his response opens with a call to action. I think that's bold. Uh, and that the call to action is not to immediately be busy, but to be aware. So he says, listen, so that you might learn to love God with integrity of heart, integrity of mind, integrity of soul, and integrity of strength. Uh, that's my paraphrase. And he adds, once you've figured out loving yourself to integrity, then love your neighbor as well. Uh, and not just also, but love your neighbor as well as you love yourself, meaning with integrity. Uh, and this is, if you're not familiar with Jesus or Christianity or the tradition, this is sort of classic uh, Jesus pushing past self and ego to help us see uh, both the presence and the value of others. Um, the presence of the unknown, uh, the neighbor, the stranger, the other, the community. Uh, and this is the process Jesus is always inviting people into to move past self or ego uh, from, from I to we, um, from me to us, to, to the acknowledgement that there's more going on than just me. Uh, and maybe you're like, okay, you know, fine, take it or leave it, Jesus as a, as a teacher. Um, but what about politics? What about racism? What about COVID? What about the economy? What about education, small businesses, the arts, entrepreneurs? What about uh, the university on our doorstep and all these students with open minds and passionate, passionate convictions, do these deserve some of our attention, some of our sacred ambition and our vital energy? Yeah, absolutely. Is this also beyond overwhelming? Yes, for me it is. And, and like Teresa shared, we, we can absolutely burn ourselves crispy trying to fix and engage and advocate and organize and convince and, and make space and create dialogue and take advantage of teachable moments and foster self-growth and build community and on and on and on and on. These are all good things. And they all take very real energy. And if we neglect the simple foundation of heart, mind, soul, and strength, we will find ourselves in that flurry of activity that's screaming into the noise, but we won't have peace. And so we won't be able to make our highest contribution to ourselves, our families, our communities. And so when Jesus is asked, he connects this holistic integrated love with the love of neighbor. And again, this, this love beyond self, this love beyond ego. And the, the original quote goes like this, hear, O Israel, this is from Deuteronomy 6, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and with all your strength or might. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise. Find them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. This is what Jesus was raised with, and after his ministry, whatever you think about it, uh, he was a compelling dude. People were into what he was doing. He seemed like he was making people feel better, whatever you think about healing. Uh, he was pushing the bounds of religion with an ethical teaching that was changing things. He was challenging the power systems of the day that oppressed 90% and benefited the top 10%. Uh, he, he was... Uh, he was a cool figure. He was a political guy. He was gathering movements. He was making moves. And when he's asked what's most important, he quotes this thing from his childhood. He quotes this thing from Hebrew school. This would be like you guys at, you know, the height of progressive 
theology and community in Volusia County asking me what I think is really like the cutting edge and me saying something like uh, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, I, you know, giving you some kind of a, a Sunday school answer. Jesus, this like compelling boundary pushing front of the movement edge breaker is asked what's most important and he quotes his Hebrew school prayer. Hear, O Israel, God is God alone. God is God alone. <laughs> There's a sensibility, uh, and, and I love that he names them Israel. I, I love that in the Shema that, that it's, it's a call to Israel specifically. It's not just listen up anybody, but Israel specifically. Listen up if you've wrestled with God. That's the name Israel someone who wrestles with God. So if you've ever wrestled with God, listen up, not for beliefs, not for answers, not for theology, but for an event, not unlike the beating of your own heart. It's mysterious. It's vital. You require it and you're not in control of it. Listen for the very source of life in which life is lived. Shema, let us listen for the invitation into some reflection, participation with experience of a, a more simple love of God. That's what I'm after. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Six words. Hear Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one, or the Lord alone. Let's approach the text with this humility this morning. We're several thousand years removed. This is none of our native language. And on a first reading, I want to acknowledge that it sounds like it's maybe about superiority or monotheism. That the text is saying our God is the best or our God is the only one. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons that I, in other sermons, would have taken 15 minutes and just a lot of biblical studies because of my own insecurity. Trust me when I say the text is actually a reaction to idolatry. Um, it, it's not about uh, superiority. It's not about monotheism. Uh, in fact, it's connected to the story of Aaron and the golden calf. And, and the point is, the issue is not superiority or monotheism, which I think is good news for us as you use. The issue being addressed in the Shema is idolatry. See, what follows the no other gods in Deuteronomy 5, right out of the law, and it comes right before the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, you find this little quote. You shall make for yourself no idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Let me make sure I explain this uh, so I don't go too quick. He's not just saying don't make, uh, don't make idols to golden calves. He's not saying don't make statues to other gods. He's not saying to us, uh, don't just make an idol to Facebook or Starbucks or Target or whatever your other gods are. And he's not even talking about the, the grotesque and ironically deaf golden Trump idol at the CPAC conference last weekend. He's not just saying don't create idols uh, to other or to lesser gods. He's saying don't even make an idol to Yahweh. Don't even make a statue that points to your own God. Make no graven image, period. And you need to understand how difficult this is. In the ancient Near East, where every other religion had an image for their deity, for their God, for their goddess, for whatever their animal was, except Israel. All the other ancient Near Eastern cultures, every other religion shared with Israel, at the minimum, sacrifices, temples, priests food laws, rules on clothing, behavior, marriage laws, building codes, but at the center of every one of their temples, every one of their holy places, all the others had an altar with an idol, with a statue, with a figure, with an image, with a candle burning to it, not Israel. Because the rule is not even an image of Yahweh, not even an image of their God. And that's something most people don't know about the story of the golden calf. The golden calf was not another god. That was their best crack at what Yahweh looked like. The calf was meant to be an idol to Yahweh. And that's what got Yahweh so pissed. 
Imagine you've been told you have to love this God that you can't see. Everyone else gets to see their God, not you. No physical representation. You can't hone this God, craft this God, set this on a shelf as a reminder. So at its core, whatever this love for God is, it must be grounded in mystery. <laughs> it must be grounded in humility. You don't even know this God's name. You don't get to know what this God looked like or even much of an idea what this God is like which is compelling. It's a neat story, it's sort of a cool TED talk, but if idolatry is the main problem in the Bible, what does it have to do with us? Uh, let's say for the sake of argument that an idol, uh, a sacred object, is simply anything that promises certainty and satisfaction. Maybe that's through meaning, maybe that's through identity, maybe that's through purpose, maybe that's through truth, maybe that's through provision, uh, but promising certainty or satisfaction that is not rooted in one source, that's an idol. And if that's the case, then maybe idolatry is something we're still wrestling with in the modern world. And all we have to do is look at our lives day to day, week to week, and ask, are there things that are promising us meaning, that are promising us identity, that are promising us truth, that are promising us certainty and satisfaction, uh, God winds up with some really interesting names, right? God winds up in the same vending machine as my Volkswagen and the PhD that I want to get one day. God winds up in the same vending machine as this compelling figure Q and other political leaders. God winds up in the same vending machine as the extremely elite liberal left, uh, who, who as right as they may be, uh, can't be kind to help themselves. <laughs> uh, it's just another product to fix uncertainty and satisfaction. It's just another pill to give us what we really want, which means, by the way, and I think maybe this is what Jesus is getting at by pushing against idolatry. If it's just a pill to get what we really want, then what we really want is not God. It's that thing. <laughs> Instead of loving God, God becomes currency that buys us the thing we really want, which makes it, by the way, an idol. And you may be wondering, well, what do you, you, know, what do you mean we really want an idol? So what the, what the text says, what the language says, and obviously this is Hebrew, it's a poor language, so it's not precise language. It says God is one, God alone. Uh, they're saying in two very Jewish ways. They're saying God is not an idol. <laughs> And God should not be idolized. Um, and, and let me just put in very clear language what this means. Uh, our belief systems about God are not God. God alone is God. Our theology and our language about God are not God. Because God alone is God. Even our very best understanding of our sacred text or whatever our sacred source is, it is not God. God alone is God. Our religions, our denominations, our creeds, as great as they are, as far as we're evolving them, they are not God. Even our experiences of God, very real transcendent experiences, they're not the fullness of God. Because as the Shema says, God alone is God. What we think of, the image in our mind, the feeling, our deep desire to grasp this reality, whatever it is that's loaded up in the word God, when we think it, Say it, imagine it, pray it. That is not God, but God alone is God. The name of God is the name of a call that is by its nature resistant to being nailed down in an image or a concept. In his work toward a radical theology, uh, a philosopher from Syracuse University called Jack Caputo says this. He says, the name of God is the name of a call to which we are supposed to be the response. Without the response, the name is a dead letter. The real death of God is to ignore the call, to let the specter expire, to let it draw its really last breath. 
for all the world, the only thing anyone can see and the only thing that exists is the response. The only witness to the call is the response. The rest is spectral, invisible, ghostly. Specters expect the truth. They expect us to make the truth come true. He goes on, truth here doesn't mean what it means back in the departments of modern philosophy. Propositions inside our head, picking out objects in the world outside our heads. Instead, truth means facere veritatum, making the truth, doing the truth, making our lives into a work of truth. When the mystic Meister Eckert says, God needs us, he gets the whole idea. Without us, the name of God is a tinkling symbol. It's just talk. When Paul says, we fill up what's lacking in the body of Christ, he gets the whole thing. The earthly body of Jesus has taken its leave from the world, and now it is up to us to heal the sick, that he left behind and to proclaim this year of good news. When the author of the fourth gospel says the word must become flesh, he gets it. The disembodied spectrality of the call must be brought into word and flesh and blood. The call must become a response. The word must become flesh. We listen and we practice forming our hearts and our minds and our souls and our strength not so that we can be right, but so that we can become the response to the call, so that we can make this beloved community, so that we might become the embodiment of the call rather than a community that celebrates the very best idol. And listen, I'll say it. If it was an idol contest, I'd be at Mosaic. I think you guys have the best language. I think your theology is it. I think you're the closest thing to what's going on. And I think the very best of what's going on is the community you're building and the the direction that it's pointed, which is back into serving the community. I think it's gorgeous. The Shema is an invitation to step toward and to step into the orbit of this God that's mystery, an invitation that's rooted at its core in humility, not in the certainty of sight, but in a faith that listens. At its deepest level, I think idolatry, at least for me, uh, has to do with our response to mystery, to unknowing, for me, to insecurity. Uh, And I think at its simplest level, the Shema says you can't love God by making God an answer to your problems. God is not the magic pill on Google ads that will make you skinny or happy or feel loved or find the right person or get the dream job or avoid suffering or even to know for sure that there is a God. That's not something God gives us. God is not a genie and God doesn't work for you. Uh, God's story is, is not a story of certainty and satisfaction, but rather a call to wholeness and to oneness. And I think it's this call that is God and this call that is God alone. Uh, And and when we try too hard uh, to put our forms and our desires uh, and our specifics on that call, um, we often maybe accidentally with good intentions end up pushing it on people. Uh, And I think the harder and the wiser thing to do is to continue to listen, uh, to listen inside to listen inside. I want to I close with this reading from uh, one of my favorite spiritual teachers, a guy called Frederick Buechner. Um, and uh, if you want to close your eyes, you can. This would sort of be like a closing meditation if you'd like. Um, and I'll just, I'll end with an amen when I feel like we're ready. Uh, let's practice together. If I can't see you for some reason, but can only hear you, you don't exist for me in space, which is where seeing happens, but in time, which is where hearing happens. Your words follow one after the other, the way talk follows tick. 
when I have only the sound of you to go by, I don't experience you as an object the way I would if you stood before me. Something that I can walk around, inspect from all angles, more or less define. I experience you more the way I experience the beating of my own heart or the flow of my own thoughts. A deaf man coming upon me listening to you would think, Nothing of importance was going on, but something of extraordinary importance is going on. I am taking you more fully into myself than I can any other way. Hearing you speak brings me, by the most direct of all routes, something of the innermost secret of who you are. It is no surprise that the Bible uses hearing, not seeing as the predominant image for the way human beings know God. They can't walk around God and take God in like a cathedral or an artichoke. They can only listen to time for the sound of God. They can only listen to time for the sound of God, to the good times and bad times of their own lives for the words God is addressing to, of all people, them, you. Listen, anyone who's wrestled with God, the name of God is the name of this call and this call alone. Amen.